Um, so let's look at this panel right here, panel B, and this electron microscopy image. So this is a, an image with two endosomes here. Um, so you've got two endosomes side by side. And you can see these little black particles um, around. Those are immunogold labels. Okay, so that's a 10 nanometer gold bead that's been attached to an antibody and it is bound to some protein on the inside of this enzyme. Right? So that gold bead is 10 nanometers, which is about the size of a GFP molecule. Okay? So let's pretend for a second that instead of that gold bead, we actually had um, genetically modified this protein so that it was expressing a GFP molecule on it. That's the actual size inside the sample. But when that diffracts through the microscope and gets back to our camera or our detector, it actually looks like this. Okay? Um, that's proportional. So what happens if we had two of these GFP molecules here on the two different endosomes? Once that gets back to our detector, you probably wouldn't even be able to tell that this is two molecules. It's going to look like one. And there's no way that you can tell there's actually two endosomes there. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the diffraction limit of a light microscope. When you're really starting to look at those small details and small subcellular compartments, um, you're not going to be able to see it with a standard light microscope. So this idea of um, Ernst Abbey's diffraction limit was considered uh, essentially not just a theory, but it was, it was a law in physics, that you could not do better than this in a light microscope. Uh, so much so that it's actually even carved in stone. So this is a monument sitting outside the University of Vienna in Germany. Uh, it's still there today. And um, it was that way for, for many, many years. But I think what's kind of crazy is that Ernst Abbe came up with this in 1873. And no one ever figured out a way around this until 1994. And in 1994, two people, totally independent of one another, came up with two different ways to get around this. Um, so these were two papers, one's by Shefflin Hal, and one's by Eric Betzig. And these were um, not experimental, which was all just theoretical, uh, proposing two different ways to get around this diffraction limit. Two different ways that you could build a microscope that would go beyond that diffraction limit and allow you to resolve two molecules that are closer together um, than what was stated by Ernst Abbe. Um, and so you can see that these were actually just published a, a couple months apart back in 1994. And uh, a few years after that, they came up, they came out with some experimental proof of it. They actually built microscopes, developed this over many years. And then in 2014, um, Eric Lustig and Stefan Hell, along with William Moner from Stanford, were awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry for their work in the resolution. I put another uh, picture here as well of um, someone known as Pat Gustafson. Um, so he worked on the West Coast for a bit before he went to Genelia Farm. Unfortunately, he passed away before the Nobel Prize was awarded. But he was the driving force behind structured illumination microscopy. Um, so I'm going to talk about a lot about that today as well. Um, so I just wanted to point out that that's not supposed to be part of this, uh, this process too. So what are we actually dealing with when we talk about super resolution? Um, so like I said before, it's when we're getting down to the organellular, organellular level. I think I just made up a word there. Um, we can usually image organelles in a microscope. With a confocal microscope, you can do a pretty good job of imaging something like mitochondria or, or a Golgi stack. Um, but once you want to look inside those organelles, that's where it really becomes difficult. Okay? So if you want to start to look at the different folds of the inside of the mitochondria, you're going to have a lot of trouble doing that. And especially if you want to start pushing this to things like viruses, um, even proteins, I mean, we're definitely not quite on that level, definitely not with anything really commercially available at the moment. But what I usually say is the super resolution field is really good when you're trying to look at something inside an organelle on that level. Okay? Um, and the different techniques um, have, have different abilities to, to peer into to certain things, different levels of resolution, which we're going to talk about here. So soon after, um, 
Betzig and Howell started this whole field of super resolution across the view, it really took off. And I had actually done my graduate work in uh, cell signaling, and I got really sick of three letter acronyms for every protein. So then I shifted to microscopy, thinking I was finally rid of the acronym world. And then this happened. Um, I haven't updated the slide in a while. It's probably way worse than this. But the good news is, is that we can take all of these acronyms and we can put them into four categories. Um, so something called image scanning microscopy. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's something like ARI scans. So we have the ARI scan detector upstairs. That's one implementation of image scanning microscopy. Uh, structure illumination microscopy, single molecule localization, and then result or step. So these are kind of the four categories of super resolution microscopy. And we can subdivide these a little bit more because although all of these techniques technically break the diffraction limit, they aren't all theoretically unlimited in the resolution that they can achieve. Okay? So the image scanning microscopy and standard structured illumination microscopy, these are still limited. Although they can break the diffraction barrier, they're still limited to, it's around two times the diffraction limit. So they can double your resolution, but not go much further than that. Right? Whereas um, the, the different techniques at mind here are theoretically unlimited. That means in a mathematical formula, you can make an argument that they could achieve the same resolution of the electron microscope. In practicality, that doesn't happen for most of them. Um, but in theory, if you had enough laser power or something like this, you, uh, or you could collect enough photons from the sample, you could have a theoretically unlimited resolution. Right. So what I want to talk to you today is about structured illumination, single molecule localization, and then about result or, or step. And that's the order we're going to tackle these things. Right. So in, in learning about super resolution microscopy, the, the one that I've had the most trouble with is um, SIP, structured illumination. This, this is the most difficult for me to kind of wrap my head around. So what I have today is a whole bunch of props here. And I'm going to try to explain this to you. Uh, using props. But the way I kind of think about it um, is to think of the microscope objective as being uh, a special type of filter. So if we think about a coffee filter, we're all used to this. We put big stuff in on the top, we run some water through that, it holds the big stuff, the coffee grounds up top, and the small things come through the bottom. You can kind of think of a microscope objective as being the opposite. You have some really small things, some really fine details, some structures in your sample that you're interested in looking at, but those can't get through that objective. Only the bigger structures get through the objective and back here. Uh, okay, so that's one way to kind of think about it. Think of this microscope objective as being a backwards filter. The big structures, the small structures go into it, but only the big ones get back to your camera. Okay. So if we wanted to see these small structures passing through this inverse filter, there's one little trick that we can play. And that trick is to take those small structures and artificially make them larger. Okay. So this is the whole idea behind SIM, is trying to use a little trick to extract those really fine structures by making them thick enough or large enough that we can actually see them on our detector. And so the way this is done um, is by creating what's known as a moray fringe. Um, so here's demo number one. This is not a moray fringe yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spin this wheel, OK? I'm going to try and spin it really fast. What do you think you're going to see when this wheel spins? Do you still see lines, or what do you think you're going to see? <coughs> Gray, one color. OK, let's give it a try and see what happens. I'm going to try it. This only works when it's spinning really fast once it starts to slow down to the work at all. What you see? Circles, right? OK, so what's happening is when that's spinning really fast, your eye is kind of integrating a whole bunch of different positions of those stripes all at once. Um, so if anyone didn't see that, I did a little demo. Uh, I took this pattern right here, these stripes. I rotated it 
Um, I think it was 720 times, and then integrated all of those on top of one another, and this is what you see. Okay, so exactly what we were saying was just you can start to see these stripes. Okay, so that's not a Moray fringe, not at all. <laughs> so I'm going to do the same thing now on this computer screen that I just did with that spinning wheel. Okay, so I'm going to take this rectangle and I'm going to rotate it. Or sorry, the square with the, the stripes, I'm going to rotate it. So I want you to look for those same circles, okay? We're trying to see those same circles here. You see the circles? No, it doesn't look like circles at all, right? Okay, so this is a moray fringe. So a moray fringe happens when you have two fine patterns um, or two grids that are overlaying each other and they interfere with one another. And it creates these thicker, wavier lines that you're seeing as a moray fringe. So my question is, what's interfering here? What's different between when I spin this, I just got these stripes, there's nothing for them to interfere with. When this spins, it's interfering with something because this is more a printer. Give you a hint, you can't see it. How does this projector work? Is this projector shining solid stripes up here? No. What's it shining up here? Um, frames. Yeah, frames and little pixels, right? If I get up here really close, I can actually see all these little white squares. And if I'm sitting right here, I can see this fine grid pattern that's up there. I can't see it on the block, obviously, but I can see it on the white lines. So what's happening here is where you're sitting, when I spin this square, it's showing you data that's invisible to you that you can't resolve. You can now see it as by seeing that moray fringe, all right? And this is exactly what we're going to do with structured illumination. So it turns out, um, in a microscope, if you take two laser beams and focus them to a point in what's called the back focal plane of the objective, so this is the, the microscope objective obviously focuses to your sample. If you go to an equal distance on the other side of the, the lens group, you have the back focal plane. If you focus light to two little dots in that back focal plane, when it hits the sample plane of your sample, that light constructively and deconstructively interferes and creates stripes across your sample. Okay? So this is what we're going to do with structured illumination is instead of evenly illuminating your sample, we're going to illuminate with it with stripes of light. Okay? And the way we get these two dots is inside the microscope there's something called a diffraction grating, which is what this is here as well, just a much cheaper version. Uh, much cheaper. <laughs> so if I shine my laser beam through here, you can see there's um, the big main beam going straight through in the middle, and then there's those two little dots on the outside there. So we call those the plus one and minus one uh, diffraction lines. And what we do is we actually collect that plus one and minus one and focus those through our lens system to those two points in the, the back of the microscope. And that creates these stripes on our sample. So that's just another image of exactly the same thing, a slightly more expensive one. Uh, and this is what the actual microscope looks like. So we have our excitation laser coming in here. It goes through that diffraction grating. And we have that main beam that goes straight through. And then here's our plus one and our minus one. These get focused down onto our sample. That creates our striped illumination pattern. We get some fluorescence, which goes back up, passes through a dichro up here, and goes up and gets focused on our camera. So it's essentially just a wide field microscope using a laser for excitation and putting this diffraction grating in, in that light path. Right. So now what we end up having is a structured illumination pattern that because we know the characteristics of that diffraction grating, we know exactly what the stripes are going to look in our, like in our sample. So this is a known. We now have some fine structures in our sample that are going to interfere with the structured illumination pattern, and that's going to create some moray fringes that we're going to image on our camera. And now this is a very simple algebra equation where all we're solving for is our single unknown. Okay? The math is way more complex than that. I certainly do not understand it myself. Um, but we have that structured illumination. We take our image. This is going to have some moray fringes in it. If we do the algebra, we 
we can then solve for our underlying image, which is this nice super resolved image of a nuclear membrane with some nuclear core complexes. Okay. So that's the idea behind structured illumination. And that's just an example of an image that, that we took up in the on the Oliroscope up in the, the HCBI. Um, there's a couple, there's a little more to it than that. Obviously, if you just have those stripes parked in one position, you're only illuminating part of your sample. So what we're going to do is we're going to shift those stripes laterally up and down five times so we ensure that we excite every floor floor in our field of view. And then if we just left them on a single <coughs> angle, um, we'd only be improving our resolution in one direction. So what we also want to do is rotate that grid multiple times. So in our system, you can do it three or five times. And at each one of those rotations, we also do these five shifts. So for every Z plane right here, you would get 15 images. So three rotations with five lateral shifts. You do five rotations with 25 images. Um, so this is, um, it's a very powerful technique in that if you're getting pretty good images on a confocal, you can usually take your sample straight to structured illumination. Uh, but you do have to remember that this is still limited. So this is going to approximately double your diffraction limit uh, or reduce your diffraction limit by half. Um, but it's not going to do any better than that. So with a green dye, we're looking at about 120 nanometers. Uh, be a little bit worse with red dyes. Okay. That's what we're looking at with structured illumination. Okay, so the next technique is single molecule localization. So here again, we've got a nice big white square. And as we know from what we were talking about before, this is actually made up of a whole bunch of different pixels. So if I wanted to count how many pixels were there, can anyone think of a way we could do that? I'm going to give you a hint. Let's say we have one of these light switches for every pixel. How about we just turn on one light switch at a time? Great. So that's what we're going to do. All right? So if you think of this um, in terms of a microscope, what we can do is just randomly turn it on one floor floor at a time, and then we're going to estimate its location. Okay. So when we turn on that one floor floor, like I said before, when it gets back to our camera, it's not going to look like that little single point of light. It's going to look like our blurry, airy disk, airy pattern. Okay. So we can't, when we just image that single molecule, we can't be overly accurate in where its actual center is because we have this big blurry spot. But what we can do is we can do some fitting on this. We can fit it to a Gaussian function, and we can start to figure out where its center is. Okay. So this right here is a simulation of a single point of light with a 1.4 numerical aperture objective. Uh, this is the wavelength of light that it's emitting at. And in this image right here, every pixel represents 5 nanometers. Okay. But there's a problem here. The pixel size on our microscope camera is not five nanometers, okay? It's usually more in the range of 50 to 100 nanometers. So is this gonna look that pretty when we get it back on our camera, on our microscope? No, it's gonna be a lot blurrier and a lot more pixelated, okay? So if this is what it looks like with those five nanometer pixels. If we put it onto a camera chip where it's um, I think I did this at 50 nanometers. And we integrate the intensity in each one of those squares. It actually looks like this. So you can see each of those pixels now is a little bit bigger. And so the question <coughs> now is, how far does this floor for have to move before we can detect that its center has shifted? Right? If you had have asked me this years ago, I would have said it had to move a distance Okay? That's not true at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shift this a third of a pixel. Okay? If I just do that, you can see that intensity pattern across the pixels is changing. OK? 
Okay? And it's not that it's just shifting like a pixel over. It's the actual intensity pattern in those pixels is different. So if we take those two images and we just fit uh, a curve over across them, so a Gaussian curve across them, what you can see is um, this is 55 pixels wide, this image up here. And you can see in this first image, it's perfectly centered at pixel 27. I shifted it a third of a pixel. We do that same fitting. So we can now see that we've moved about a third of a pixel. Okay. So this just shows you that you can actually easily detect these sub-pixel shifts in localization. So we can be much accurate, much more accurate than the actual size of our pixels on the camera. So um, that's all fine and good if we just have one floor for sitting there, but obviously that's not what happens in our sample. So how do we localize these really dense floor floors? How do we do this on off switching? So let's say we had some molecules that were arranged in this order. Each one of these is a, an individual floor part. We shine a laser on them, they all turn on at the same time and they look like a blurry mess. So what we want to do is come up with some method where we can send in some excitation light and say only turn on about three of these, a handful of them. As long as they're still more than the diffraction limit apart from one another, that's totally fine. Okay? So we turn on a couple of those. It here is big blurry spots on our camera. We do that Gaussian fitting. We fit the curve to each one of them, and we find their actual pinpoint location, and we put a dot there. Then we just keep, uh, we turn these three off, and then we repeat this process with the different batch of molecules. Okay, so we turn on some different ones, localize those, and we just keep going through this process over and over again. It's usually somewhere between like 20 and 20,000 times. And eventually, we build up a smaller image with a very high resolution. So this is sort of the same thing, just in a different graphical form. So here's our fluorophore on our camera chip. Um, this is the intensity on our camera. This is just it shown out in 3D. And so we're going to put a Gaussian fit on that. And with that Gaussian fit, we can be really precise with the localization of that actual fluorophore. This big scary equation here is what describes how accurate we are with finding map locations. And what's really important here, there's two terms in here that are important, this B and this M. Um, <coughs> sorry, I didn't write out what they actually are. Uh, so N is the number of photons that you collect. So the more photons that you collect, the more accurate you are. So dyes that shoot out a lot of photons in a small amount of time are really helpful here. And then this B, this refers to the background, so what your signal-to-noise ratio is. So if you're doing this imaging, you have a cell and a cover slit in turf mode, you have a really high signal-to-noise ratio, you're just exciting a few things along the cover slit, um, this number is going to be really low. If you've got a tissue section on there and you're eliminating an empty fluorescence, this number is going to be really high, and you're not going to do any better than you would with a, a regular microscope. Okay. These are the two things to keep in uh, consideration for the molecule equation. How much background do you have and how many um, photons are coming off your sample? So how do we actually do this transition? There's two ways to do this. Um, we can do it with photoswitchable proteins. So there's a bunch of proteins out there like MPOs or MMAPLE, PAGFP. These will transition between either a dark state and a bright state or a uh, green state and a red state, just by usually hitting them with some near UV light. Right? So that's one way we can do it. The other way to do it, and which is probably a little more commonly used, is to do it with dark state transitioning dyes. And this is what's more commonly referred to as uh, D-storm or direct storm. Um, and the idea here is, so this is the energy diagram of the typical fluorophore. So it's sitting in its relaxed state, it gets hit with some with an excitation focus that goes up to a higher energy level. And then usually it falls back down to the ground state by releasing another photon of redshift of light. Okay. What we usually don't talk about is this over here. This is what's called the triplet state. And this is another energy state that you can go through something called inner system crossing. And when that um, molecule, that dye molecule is excited, it can convert into this triplet state. 
And that triplet state's a little bit weird. So there's a lot of ways out of that triplet state. Um, so it can fall back down to the ground state without giving off much light. Uh, the other thing that it can do is, this is where photo bleaching happens. So your molecule can get bleached here and then be absolutely useless afterwards. Uh, and then the other option is, if it collects a little bit more energy, it can go back into this excited state again and then release a photon. So essentially what we do with these dark state transitioning guys is we try to push all of them into this triplet state, and we try to prevent this bleaching from occurring. And then we try to send them back into the excited state just a few molecules at a time. So the way we do that, one of the best fluorophores for doing this with is Alexa 647. So you have a sample labeled with Alexa 647. What you're going to do is take a 633, 640 nanometer laser, turn it on 100% full blast, and what you're going to see is uh, obviously a big explosion of brightness at first, and then this is going to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as those molecules transition over into this triplet state, okay? And once we've got everything transitioned over there, what we do is we add a little bit of extra energy by shooting in some 405 nanometer light, and that's gonna give these uh, molecules that are in this triplet state enough energy to hop back into the excited state back here, and then they can fall back down by giving off a photon. Right. To make this work, there's a couple things that are important. Um, one is that you you can't have <coughs> oxygen there. When you have oxygen in your sample, that's what leads to bleaching. So if you have lots of oxygen there, you're just going to bleach this, and you're not going to get any of this molecular switching that you want. The other thing that seems to help the process along as well is, is some thiol, to, to have some thiol in the mix there as well. Okay. So this is just an example of what this looks like. Um, so whenever you make it in diagrammatic form, it always looks perfect. Uh, here it looks less perfect, but you can see it's really, really bright to begin with. It's slowly getting dimmer and dimmer, and you can see all these other molecules all around that are just single molecules that are coming out of that triplet state, firing big, um, bright signal, and then disappearing really quickly as well. Um, so actually, this one was actually done with a photo switchable. Um, but, but by the way, it, it all looks the same. Okay. So if you take all of those little dots, all of those little localizations, and afterwards you put them all together, this is what you can get. So it's a little hard to see the red signal here, but basically it, it looks like a big butterfly kind of. Um, just the red signal is just kind of everywhere there. And then the green is once we've actually taken all of those localizations uh, through our processing, you can see there's actually three very individual structures here. Right? So that's just showing you the sort of resolution improvement you can get between a standard wide field microscope and then the single molecule implantation. Alright. So the, the last technique is um, STED. So STED is based on so Structured illumination and single molecule localization are both based on wide field microscopes. STED is based on a confocal microscope, a point scanning confocal microscope. So if you think about the way a normal point scanning microscope would work, let's say we've got a whole bunch of fluorescent dyes, call this GFP molecules, that are sitting within 200 nanometers of each other. Usually when we do this with point scanning confocal, we turn on a laser beam, all of those get excited at the same time, and when it gets back to our detector, it just looks like a big blurry mess. Okay. So the question with STED is, is there some magical donut out there that we can overlay over top of this? And the magical properties of this donut cause all fluorophores underneath it to turn off, and only the ones that are sitting inside the middle of that donut can stay on. <coughs> And then what we could do is scan that donut along with our laser beam back and forth across our sample like we always do in a point scanning confocal. And this is exactly what's happening with STED. So essentially what we're doing is just shrinking the size of the excitation laser spot that we're scanning back and forth across our sample. So the magical donut that we use is, is not a pink wonderful donut off the Simpsons. 
it's actually another laser beam. So if you ignore this orange laser right now, this is just a standard point scanning convocal. So we have excitation that comes in, gets focused to a point, we get some fluorescence that goes back, passes through a pinhole, and goes on to our detector. Right? But with STEP, what we do is we add in this extra laser beam. So this one, the wavelength of this beam is tuned to the end of the emission profile of our dye. I'll tell you why in a second why that's important. Uh, but what we do is we put in this component here called a phase modulator. And what this does is when light passes through that phase modulator, it turns it into a donut shape. So once it gets focused by our objective here, instead of being focused to a point like our excitation spot, it's focused to this donut shape. So essentially what there is is there's a lot of destructive interference right in the focal spot, and all that laser energy gets pushed out to the outside of our focus. So now if you put this on top of this one, um, and because this guy is turning molecules off, the actual effective fluorescent spot, so the spot where we're, the only spot where we're getting fluorescence from, is now this nice small dot. This one's about 60 nanometers, 70 nanometers, instead of the big one that was up around 200 nanometers. So now we've greatly improved our resolution if we scan with that, or those two lasers on top of each other, as opposed to just a single, single laser. And like I said, this works just like a regular confocal, so we just scan that back and forth across our sample, only turning on the molecules that are in the middle of that donut at any one time. So what is that magical donut actually doing? So I said before it was turning the fluorophores off. That's not at all what it's doing. So if we look at a typical um, fluorescent dye here, I think this is Alexa 48. We have our excitation spectrum on this side and then our emission spectrum over here. Um, basically, these absorption spectra and emission spectra, they're not single lines. So there isn't a single wavelength of absorption and a single wavelength of emission. And the reason for that is these guys can actually absorb at a bunch of different wavelengths. Um, and all it means is that the further you go with the absorption spectrum, the further you go to the UV, the more energy you need to get it up to that excited state. So if you use some UV light, you can put it in and bump that molecule way up to a really high excitation state, okay? But you can see that the most efficient process is to do it right here at the peak of the absorption spectrum. So kind of a, a similar thing happens in the emission spectrum in that there are a whole bunch of different wavelengths that that dye can admit at when it's falling back down to the ground state, okay? So you can see all the arrows that are down here. This particular dye can release everything from like a green wavelength out to an orange wavelength. And the only difference is, is what energy level, so even the ground state has different energy levels, what energy level you end up down at. So what this magical donut does instead is it forces the, the dye when it comes back down to only come down one of these arrows. So instead of allowing it to come down on these four different arrows, we're only going to allow it to come down on this orange one at the very end there. And this is a process known as stimulated emission. It's how this laser pointer works. It's how every laser works. But essentially what it says is when you have a dye that's in the excited state, if you hit it with another photon while it's in that excited state, what it's going to do is it's going to release uh, a photon that's exactly the same as that one when it falls back down to the ground state. So you're just forcing it to come back down at a particular wavelength. So what we do is we have our excitation laser that's in the middle of that donut that excites our dye up to the excited state. And then what we have on the outside here is uh, that stead donut of a particular wavelength that matches this orange arrow. And it's forcing all those excited um, molecules fall back down to the ground state by releasing this orange photon. Okay. And then what we do is we set up our detection window in front of our camera or our detector inside these two lines. Okay. So what that means is that any of the fluorophores that are in the center right here that fall down on these green or yellow arrows, they'll get collected onto our detector. But anything that is forced by this donut to come down the orange arrow lands outside of our detection range and we don't see it. So we're not turning it off, it's still a 
chlorophores in the outside there are still giving off fluorescence, we're just forcing them to come down outside of our detection range. And when you do that, you can take something like this confocal image of synaptofecin on purified endosomes, uh, run it under the stead microscope, and then improve this resolution. Cool. So just a quick summary before we talk about what we can do in the, the facility. So structured illumination uses these moray fishes that we create by interfering with spine structures to make things look thicker so that can pass through that weird inverse filter that that objective is actually has. Single molecule localization is just turning on molecules one at a time. We're able to extract the exact localization of those molecules through mathematical fitting. And then we just repeat that process over and over again to build up our final image. And then SCAD is just shrinking the effective diameter of the excitation laser that the raster scanning back and forth across our sample. And at Donix using a process known as stimulated emission to confine those emission photons to a wavelength that's outside our detection range. So those are the three major techniques in super resolution microscopy. So now at the HCBI, we are able to perform two of these techniques. So we can do structured illumination, and we can do single molecule localization. And we do both of these techniques on our Elira microscope. So this is actually a really interesting microscope. It's got kind of five microscopes in one. So there's a, a standard confocal scan head over on this side. Um, then there's two cameras. This is a little different than ours. Ours actually has one camera on this side, and then we have another camera underneath the table. Uh, one of those cameras we use for structured illumination, and the other we use for a single molecule localization. Our lasers that we use for the super resolution modes come into this unit on the back here. And that can either choose uh, epifluorescence, excitation pattern, it can do turf, or it can do the structured illumination stripes. Uh, so that's all controlled in the little box on the back there. So there's a couple considerations that, that you should really keep in mind when, when you want to attempt a super resolution experiment. Obviously, the first consideration is do you need that resolution? Um, I would say it's definitely. Uh, I don't want to say a niche area, but there are a certain number of experiments that need it. There's a lot of experiments that don't. So some of these experiments can be pretty involved and pretty difficult if you don't need to go down that road. Uh, if you're getting what you need out of confocal or even wide field, stick to that. Um, I would like to try simplest to hardest to, to see how we can get the needy. But uh, once you do have uh, a sample that definitely needs it, Here's a couple things to consider. The first thing you want to think about is how thick is your sample. Uh, with all super resolution techniques, the thinner you can make your sample, the better your images are going to be in the end. Okay? Structured illumination, um, as far as what we're doing in, in the facility, this one has the ability to deal with the thickest samples. So I think our record right now is uh, a 50 micron tissue section that we were able to image all the way through with really good resolution and not any artifacts during the processing afterwards. Um, so definitely um, anything over 50 microns is probably not going to happen. Uh, with structured illumination, this technique we do have, um, we do do 3D structured illumination. So everything I talked to you before about was just improvements in X and Y in lateral resolution. Structured illumination that we have will also improve in 3D as well, okay? Uh, in comparison to confocal. Now, single molecule localization, on the other hand, we usually only do this on single cells, and we usually perform it in turf mode. So we're only looking a few hundred, mic uh, few hundred nanometers in from the cover slip. So this is really good for things that are in the membrane or right up close to the membrane. If you're trying to go all the way through a cell, it's going to get a little bit deep, more difficult. Uh, we also don't have any 3D ability with uh, single molecule localization on our microscope. So you're basically, whatever you're exciting, you're getting a maximum intensity projection of that. You're improving your XY resolution, but, but not in Z. Okay. So with these guys, definitely single cells or, or less is 
that's. So which dye should you choose? Uh, so with structured illumination microscopy, we just use traditional dyes for that. There's no need for anything special. Um, the best options for the system that we have, because this is wide field mode, we use filter cubes to separate your dyes. So we have four filter cubes that will work with DAPI, um, Alexa 488, Alexa 568, and Alexa 647. So those are the optimal dyes, or obviously anything that's spectrally similar to these. Uh, so it doesn't have to be an Alexa dye. Um, those are all options on the system. I will say, in general, DAPI usually doesn't look all that great with structured illumination. The reason for that is for a structured illumination image to look really good, it needs to see contrast. With the DAPI stain, you have a big blurry blob of blue. You have good camp contrast on the edge of your nucleus, but there isn't really a lot of contrast on the inside of it. Um, but if you're using, say, like a blue dye, like EB421, um, that might come out a little bit better. Okay, hey, for single molecule localization, the important thing here is that you need a switchable dye. So you need something that like can transition from a dark state to a bright state, or a green state to a red state. So this can be a fluorescent protein, like MEOS or M maple, or it can be one of those dark state transitioning dyes. So Alexa 647 is the, the one that works really well. Um, we have some other options that have worked from time to time, but not as consistently as this, and that's uh, Psi 3, 0.5 or Psi3B, um, and ADO488. But definitely, if, if you only need one, this is, this is the one to go with. And another thing that's really important is the mounting medium. Uh, so with structured illumination, it's really important to get the, a perfect refractive index match through your entire sample. And by that, I mean from the oil that you put on the objective, to the cover slip, to the mounting media that your sample is in. The reason for this is SIM, the processing is um, essentially deconvolution on steroids. If you have any aberration in your sample, deconvolution makes that aberration look way worse. So what you want to make sure is that you don't have any aberration and a perfect refractive index match through there. So um, what I like to suggest to people is use a SIM product from Thermo Fisher called Prolong Glass. Uh, once it's cured for at least 24 hours, it's going to have the same refractive index as the oil and the cover slip. Another cheaper option is um, a chemical called TDE. There's a recipe on our website on how to make this up. Uh, you just have to watch it. It's not really compatible with green dyes. It just, they just bleach like crazy. You know? um, but it's good for red and far red dyes. Uh, for single molecule localization, there's no real special consideration. Um, for the, the mounting media for fluorescent proteins, uh, the switchable fluorescent proteins, pretty much anything that you've been using is going to be fine. Um, for the dyes, it's really important that there's some sort of oxygen scavenging system there. So you need to make sure that there isn't going to be any oxygen hanging around so you don't get bleaching. And the other thing that helps is um, to add a file and buffer. So there's a, a couple what are called storm buffers out there, where you get the thiol either from the or capoeuphanol or MEA. Uh, I prefer MEA. It works a little bit better with Alexa 647, and it also doesn't stink up the entire facility, um, which is a nice addition. And um, there's also a, a glucose oxidase um, oxygen scavenging system put in there. Uh, another more simple way that tends to work is to just mount your sample in Vecta Shield. You often don't get as good um, a blinking and as quick a transition to the dark state, but it can be a little bit easier than trying to mix up that buffer, because that buffer has to be mixed up fresh right away before you put the sample in there. So. And the, the last consideration is which objectives to use. And I have to apologize, because for five years I've been telling people the wrong thing, and I just found this out last week. Um, so the Alira microscope, uh, in Zeiss's design for structured illumination, it's actually optimized to the 63x objective. So if you're doing structured illumination on the Alira, your best image is going to come out with the 63x objective. The 100x objective will still work as well, but um, it's possible that your image will look a little bit better with the 63x. For single molecule localization experiments, this one you want to be using the 100x oil objective. Um, 
And this one is a special Turk objective as well. And since we're usually doing these experiments in Turk mode, uh, that's why you want to use it. Okay. Cool. So that is everything that I want to talk about today. Hopefully you now know everything you need to know about super resolution. Of course, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask me now or send me an email or drop me an office at some point. And thank you for coming out. See you in a couple of weeks.